Uh, good afternoon or, or good morning. We wanted to start off and thank you for joining us uh, for our talk today. Uh, the topic of our symposium paper is anti-racism in Catholic schools, helping students discover the moral need for change. Before we get into the outline of our presentation, we wanted to share a little bit about where our idea for this conference paper came from. Uh, we see the work we are doing as ACE teachers to be at the potential intersection of the National Black Lives Matter movement uh, and Catholic social teaching. Um, we know Catholic schools across the United States explicitly support students' moral formation by various means, including religion classes, Catholic social teaching, um, integration into the curriculum, and school-wide masses and prayer services. Uh, because of this, Catholic schools have the unique opportunity to bridge this theological moral ideology with specific anti-racist structures in the classroom, teaching practices, and amongst student bodies. Much previous research has focused solely on anti-racist pedagogy or moral character education. Uh, this conference attempts to link the two together by asserting that anti-racist pedagogy can be incorporated into moral character education. The link between these two consists of connecting the core values of Catholic education with opportunities for moral action, which are two major principles of the Character Education Partner Partnership's 11 Principles of Effective Character Education. First, moral adolescent uh, modern adolescent moral development theory will be discussed. Next, culturally relevant pedagogy, which is crucial for anti-racism, will be introduced. Third, how Catholic schools address moral education and anti-racist anti pedagogy will be explored. And finally, ways in which to connect anti-racist pedagogy to moral character education will be proposed. According to Eric Erickson's famous theory of lifelong development, critical identity development occurs during adolescence. Part of this identity development includes developing one's values and virtues, what one would call moral development. Moral development does not occur in a vacuum, however. Schools are instru instrumental in the moral development of their students, no matter if moral development is implicit or explicit. There is much debate over how visible morals and morality should be in schools. This debate is centered around what Fenstermacher et al. describes as moral manner versus moral content. Moral manner refers to traits or dispositions that the teacher exhibits, whereas moral content refers to material that is incorporated into the classroom directly. Public schools in particular limit the moral content that is presented to students, meaning that the vast majority of moral education that is presented to public school students is of the moral, moral manner variety. This is what Lapsley and Woodbury refer to as the hidden curriculum. Moral education is relegated to implicit communication rather than explicit discussion. Catholic schools, on the other hand, have the unique advantage of being grounded in Catholic values and virtues, meaning that they are free to incorporate moral content directly into their curriculum. The hidden curriculum of moral education becomes visible, and students and teachers alike are encouraged to discuss moral values and virtues freely and openly. The ability to present moral content en enhances moral manner, for having an explicit moral program or curriculum within the school signals the teacher that moral, manner moral matters are an important part of the work of teaching. So how should moral education be presented in schools then? Lapsley and Woodbury described three main approaches to the moral education in schools. One potential form of moral education is best practice in which teachers form students morally through pursuing the best possible teaching practices for student learning. This is the approach that public schools use overwhelmingly. Schools use a combination of academic press and a communitarian ethos to maximize the effectiveness of best practice. Uh, for reference, academic press is a school culture where teachers, students, and administrators are motivated by achievement goals, and a communitarian ethos is a way of organizing schools that facilitate the creation of strong emotional bonds between students and teachers and relational trust among professional staff. The main issue with the best practice approach harkens back to the fact that it is a hidden curriculum. If moral education is placed in the background and not overtly grappled with by students or staff, it cannot be addressed as fully as needed. A second approach to moral education is broad character education. And broad character education emphasizes prevention and intervention of risky behaviors. It also includes aspects such as health education, life skills training, and positive youth development. Broad character is informed by public health data to encourage avoidance of negative behavior. While this is a noble pursuit, the question of whether this is actually moral education must be raised. 
Broad character education addresses which behaviors should be avoided, but it, is not, but it does not explicitly communicate the formation of positive moral virtues and values. Therefore, is it actually moral education, is the question to be asked. Additionally, broad character education is outcome-based. It's focused solely on the observed behavior outcomes that can be observed through public health data. So once again, this neglects the process of moral formation through the promotion of values and virtues. A third approach to moral education is intentional moral character education. Moral character education is all-encompassing. It integrates a school's core values into all aspects of the life of the school, especially in the classroom. Moral character education is an improvement on best practice by making explicit the discussion of morals, values, and virtues. It's an improvement on broad character education by focusing on not only outcomes, but also the process of instilling moral values and virtues into students. Additionally, moral character education promotes not only moral content, but also moral action. By making moral formation an explicit and important part of school and student life, it can be said that moral character education is the preferred form of moral education in schools. Catholic schools are especially primed to incorporate moral character education due to its roots in the, in the teachings of the Catholic Church. Uh, Catholic schools have explicit values and virtues that they aim to promote through Catholic teaching. This grounds Catholic schools in CEP principle number one, which states the school community promotes core ethical and performance values as the foundation of good character. Furthermore, since moral character education emphasizes opportunities for moral action, students are able to actively participate in their moral formation. One practical application of this in Catholic schools is service learning, which will be discussed more in depth later in this conference. In summary, the combination of core values and moral action provide Catholic schools with a unique approach to moral, ed ed moral character education for its students. We now wanted to take some time to talk briefly about opportunities for moral action in the context of culturally relevant pedagogy. What I'd like to do is first provide an overview of culturally relevant pedagogy and its three domains, then take a closer look specifically at one of these domains, sociopolitical consciousness. And finally, I want to touch on some research related to service learning that Boston will return to later in this presentation. Before we get into those three domains, this whole idea of culturally relevant pedagogy was coined in 1995 in this paper by Gloria Ladson Billings. She was previously a professor at the University of Washington, Madison, and actually has spoken with ACE in the past. So let's take a closer look at her pedagogical, pedagogical framework. So we have this culturally relevant pedagogy or CRP that can be explained by looking at its three different domains, academic success, cultural competence, and sociopolitical consciousness. In terms of academic success, this refers to the intellectual growth that students experience as a result of classroom instruction and learning experiences. Next, there's cultural competence, which refers to the ability to help students appreciate and celebrate their cultures of origin while gaining knowledge of and fluency in at least one other culture. And finally, most important for our topic today is sociopolitical consciousness, which is the ability to take learning beyond the confines of the classroom, using school knowledge and skills to identify, analyze, and solve real world problems. Latson Billings describes the secret of culturally relevant pedagogy as, quote, the ability to link principles of learning with deep understanding of and appreciation of culture. Now I want to spend a little more time talking about what Letson Billings means when she says sociopolitical consciousness, as this is most relevant to our discussion on anti-racism. For Letson Billings, sociopolitical consciousness is the essential quality of culturally relevant pedagogy. We defined it in the previous slides, but it is ultimately the ability of students to recognize, understand, and critique societal inequities. While it may seem obvious, an important point that Letson Billings references is that teachers themselves need to recognize societal inequities and their causes. It's similar to the idea of an enduring understanding that you might think of when you're unit planning. If you as the teacher cannot articulate the enduring understanding of the main takeaways of the unit, how will you teach it to your students? The same applies to issues of social justice. We as educators are called to be aware of the issues facing our students and our world, especially as educators in Catholic schools. So it's not just teaching about issues of social justice, putting a poster up in your classroom or watching a video. Developing students' sociopolitical consciousness is about instilling in students the knowledge, skills, and values to take action against systemic oppression. Ultimately, it's, it's about empowering students to be advocates in their community. Before I turn it over to Ryan and Sophie, I wanna to touch a little bit on service learning and what makes it effective. Importantly, service learning allows students to connect core values to their education and create, creates ties between schools and communities. 
In order for service learning to be effective, there are three essential elements. One, the project ought to allow for structured time for students to discuss. This may take the form of a class discussion or turn and talk. Two, the service learning opportunity empowers students with agency. This increases their autonomy and allows them to make choices in the project. And finally, the project needs to connect directly to the course curriculum. This relates back to the academic success domain of Ladson Billings framework for CRP. Importantly, service learning has long-term implications for students because it is through these projects that students develop a moral civic identity. There was one study that two researchers did, Miranda Yates and, and James Eunice, in which they looked at a service learning project where students from a Catholic school served four times, a minimum of just 20 hours, at the same downtown soup kitchen for the homeless over the course of a year. They found that students who engaged in the service learning opportunity expressed a sense of agency and responsibility to be politically involved and to become forces for social change. The study also looked into the long-term effects of the service learning program and found that these effects are not just in the short term. The service learning experience helped adolescents define a sense of agency and social responsibility that they carried into adulthood. This has practical implications for all of us as we are required to do a service learning project as part of our AmeriCorps membership. I encourage you all to think about ways in which you are fostering service learning in your communities and classrooms because these experiences are having lasting impacts on your students. So next we look at um, how Catholic schools approach moral development today. So to start, it's important to look at uh, the differences between a Catholic school and a public school. What, does, what do Catholic schools do differently that makes it a good um, place for students to develop morally um, as uh, people? So uh, we looked at a study by Leonard Bohm called The Development of Conscience, A Comparison of Students in Catholic Parochial Schools and in Public Schools. And in this study, students in Catholic and public schools were told uh, case studies or anecdotes about a social interaction between two individuals where some injury or harm was inflicted onto uh, someone in one of these case studies or stories. Um, it was either an accident or on purpose or somewhere in that gray area in between. Um, and when students heard these case studies, uh, students in Catholic schools, um, with regard to rec recognize the distinction between motivation and the results of an action, uh, the kids in Catholic schools uh, and Catholic parochial schools um, regardless of socioeconomic class or intelligence level, we're more apt at recognizing and breaking down motivation than public school students. And uh, Bohm posits that these results come from the fact that Catholic schools from an early age um, emphasize the distinction between accident, misdeed, and sin. Um, so Catholic school students have uh, learned to evaluate a deed for its motivation and consider the results of a deed. So Catholic school students generally know better than to blame someone for an accidental mishap in spite of dire consequences, at least according to the study by Bohm. So how exactly do Catholic schools accomplish this moral education of students to get them to recognize things like uh, motivation behind deeds and stuff? And one of the most important things in Catholic schools is this idea of Catholic social teaching um, Catholic social teaching uh, is a Catholic doctrine on matters of human dignity and the common good in society, and um, it has been developed and expressed through a variety of major Catholic documents, including papal encyclicals and episcopal statements. Um, and the, catech the Catechism of the Catholic Church even presents it as an essential part of the moral teaching of the Church. Um, so the United, States uh, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops states that if Catholic education and formation fail to communicate this social tradition, uh, they cannot be considered fully Catholic. So it's important for Catholic schools and other uh, religious education institutions and faith formation institutions in the church. Um, it's vitally important that they share these values of Catholic social teaching. Um, they're an essential part of Catholic identity and formation and should be incorporated into a uh, different curricula offered by Catholic schools in every subject matter. So for example, um, an example of a principle in Catholic social teaching is the life and dignity of the human person. Um, in a social studies class, uh, there could be um, questions about the treatment of African Americans or indigenous people in the United States. Um, thinking about another uh, subject, uh, science, um, care for God's creation is another principle of Catholic social teaching. And this could um, incorporate aspects of Catholic social teaching in a middle school or high school uh, biology class. There have also been uh, new uh, ideas and new methods about moral development in moral education in Catholic schools. Um, so uh, <coughs> Graham Rossiter uh, wrote an article called Catholic Education and Values, a review of the role of Catholic schools in promoting the spiritual and moral development of pupils, where he really focuses on uh, 
the difference between student-centered learning and teacher-centered learning. So he thinks that new methods in the classroom um, should be more geared towards student-centered learning, and he uh, encourages uh, the use of inquiry-based practices. Inquiry allows students to take control of their learning and allows for a more specific issue-based approach to moral development and uh, to moral development and education. Um, as students are able to take control of how they answer important questions and how they tackle important issues, rather than having a more didactic approach um, that puts uh, the focus on the teacher and the teacher telling the students what's right. With a more inquiry-based approach, students are able to come up with their own answers to these questions, with obviously a teacher uh, facil uh, facilitating the classroom. Um, this also allows students to develop their own resources, um, which is an essential part of the process, and it allows students to ask compelling questions about um, different issues related to uh, moral uh, morals and values. All right, given the moral Catholic framework that Ryan just mentioned, it's also important to note that the Catholic Church has a united voice and stance against racism, and it acknowledges it as both an individual and systemic sin in our culture. That is according to the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Um, in fact, it states on its website that the evil of racism manifests itself in both our individual thoughts and also in the workings of our society itself. Today's continuing inequalities in education, housing, employment, wealth, and representation and leadership positions are rooted in our country's shameful history of slavery and systemic racism. So however, while the Catholic Church has a rooted stance against racism as a whole in our nation, Catholic schools have been conflicted about how to address this within the classroom itself. Two different ideologies have branched as a result of this, the first being the common humanity approach, and the second um, one that acknowledges and accepts critical race theory. Those with the common humanity approach criticize classroom exercises and lessons that seem overly reliant on racial identity or promoted conceptions of white privilege. So this group wants schools to either downplay or ignore altogether race in order to recover and emphasize the common humanity that unites us. Um, those who approach the critical race theory are more likely to, to demand schools to implement curriculum, student formation, hiring, and programmatic measures to promote greater diversity, equity, and inclusion. This group would also like to see accountability and progress in meeting measurable goals in these areas. So if we simplify this, it seems as though those with the common humanity approach tend to view racism as an individual sin, while those who um, embark on the critical race theory see racism as a systemic sin. As a result of this conflict, we see that Catholic educators find themselves somewhat caught in the middle of these two camps as they try to please and um, embrace the stakeholders of everybody in their schools. The final component of today's presentation here is going to attempt to tie together some key themes and integrate best practices into the Catholic school curriculum. I will attempt now to demonstrate how Catholic schools have an obligation to form the moral conscience of their adolescents to prepare them for how they will come to see the world as adults. A key part of this is that in today's language, a culturally relevant pedagogy is necessitated in the classroom in order to create a global conscience and inform students morally while taking into account both their own culture and cultures beyond themselves. Culturally responsive pedagogy is grounded in Catholic social teaching. To extend on Sophie's earlier point, there is a strongly worded call from the Catholic Church here in both the Catechism and from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Part of the excerpts here state that every form of social or cultural discrimination in fundamental personal rights on the grounds of sex, race, color, social conditions, language, or religion 
must be curved and eradicated as incompatible with God's design. The USCCB similarly states that there must be no turning back along the road of justice, uh, not sighing for bygone times of privilege nor nostalgia for simple solutions from another age. The question now is, how do we integrate this core teaching into our Catholic school classrooms with more regularity? As affirmed in the literature here, it is a matter of moral conscience formation that necessitates a response to the development of the global conscience. In this day and age, it would be negligent to avoid the inclusion of culturally rele relevant pedagogy as a matter of forming the global conscience in Catholic schools. Uh, the study here from Ortiz et al. discusses how in Catholic schools it is necessary to create in children a new consciousness of fundamental human need and attitudes which transcend distinctions of culture. This new moral conscience in children will contribute to the social change that humanity needs. The next research we examine discusses the ways in which adolescents are in a key phase of their life in regards to the moral and spiritual development. The Catholic school system poses a really great opportunity for engagement with moral development work in combining these two areas. Lamont also discusses how the way in which adolescents are nurtured spiritually will have a direct impact on both their faith lives and how they see others. She it applies this to the important work of encountering those who are different from themselves and the importance of being exposed to religious pluralism. We also see the importance here of applying that to culturally responsive pedagogy. How an adolescent sees others is quite literally being formed by the activities and pedagogy they are exposed to in the classroom. Cultural responsiveness allows for a broadening of that image of others, which is commanded of us as leaders of the classroom by Catholic social teaching. Finally, in terms of practical implementation of this, service learning is the very best way to integrate a culturally responsive pedagogy framework in the classroom. Service learning can deepen students' understanding of the world around them and help them form their own conclusions about people from different cultural backgrounds. The literature examined here points us to how service learning can achieve the following. It can help, stu uh, help guide students to understand systemic issues, Service is a means of involving students as aiding in the process of justice, and it helps capitalize on an experiential learning approach to a culturally responsive pedagogical lens, um, which we can see uh, provides the same sort of opportunity in moral education. Youth activism is a means of shaping political moral behavior even beyond adolescence. One example of this is the school that I am lucky enough to serve in San Jose, California, engages in this very work of service learning integration through our Christian advocacy program. All students are required to complete service and advocacy hours in which students are given the opportunity to advocate and take political or community-based action on causes that are important to them. This is excellent in regards to meeting the moral development needs of the students, but programs like this must be done more widespread throughout the nation's Catholic schools, not merely in isolated pockets. All of these concepts relating to culturally responsive pedagogy are methods by which we can further integrate a more holistic education of children as necessitated by the Catholic social teaching framework. Meeting the needs of the moral development phase of these adolescents that we serve, and finally carrying out the mission of Catholic education conscious development of our youth oriented towards achieving social change. Thank you so much for uh, watching our presentation today. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer. We'll be happy to answer them at the Q and A on Tuesday. Or um, if you're unable to attend that, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, thank you again.